Hello everyone and welcome to an exploration of SpaceX's Interplanetary Transportation System as presented by Elon Musk on September 27th, 2016. Basics of this system are probably subject to change, but we definitely have more details than we had when I made my video on the MCT and Big Falcon rocket a uh, few months ago and in that video I had a uh, MCT with a single Raptor vacuum engine and then the Big Falcon rocket had 30 uh, Raptor sea level engines. Now we know that the plan is for six Raptor vacuum engines on what is now the interplanetary transportation system and uh, those are Raptor vacuums. It also has three of the Raptor sea level engines on there as well and those gimbal these do not so these are locked gimbal so i've tried to make a model of it as accurately as possible from all the numbers i took down all the numbers uh, i even copied down all the charts uh, so we know uh, this is going this is the crude variant okay this is the one that's gonna send passengers out this is not the tanker i don't have the docking port yet for the tanker and all but uh We've got other other basics. Uh, let me show you the Delta V stats as well. So uh, you'll see uh, end mass here, uh, a, a quote unquote empty mass of 427 tons. That's because it's also carrying cargo in here. There's, there's actually a cargo tank carrying 300 tons of cargo. According to the information that we had gotten, uh, it was supposed to be 150 tons empty. Uh, the But the tanker version was uh, uh, 90 tons empty. So I assumed that the crew portion was roughly 60 tons, splitting the difference. And uh, this is 40 tons, so it's a little bit lightweight. Uh, so we'll assume that some of the crew facilities are not in there yet. So that's why the MS, uh, technically if this was fully, fully loaded, the MS should be 450 tons. Uh, if it had the 300 tons plus the full accommodations and all. Uh, otherwise, this tank has the right amount of fuel. Uh, it was specified that the, this version would have 1,950 tons of fuel, and indeed it does. So we are good there. I had to use balloon cryo tanks to make it the right shape uh, and the right size. And given the discussion in uh, the presentation about the carbon fiber tanks and how this was like cutting edge technology that they were using to make the tanks very, very light, uh, this is how it has to be. Uh, now, that's the, probably the first difficulty that struck me is whether they can really make these tanks very reliable and solid for a very long trip, right? I mean, this is a long trip out there. They have to be uh, sturdy for all of that. So, yeah, that's, that's the first difficulty, whether this cutting-edge technology is really reliable on the, on the tank construction despite it's very, very lightweight. Okay, and I have done some other work. First of all, I added uh, configurations to RCS thrusters that use methane and oxygen, because in the presentation we found out that the thrusters will use methane and oxygen uh, instead of having some other fuel to simplify matters. Uh, I might want to make those thrusters a little bit heavier. Oops, I didn't want to do that. So I might want to make these RCS thrusters a little bit heavier to compensate for the fact that they are probably going to be heavier than normal RCS thrusters. They have a modest 1.11 kilonewtons of thrust for a vehicle this size. And uh, these are the unidirectional ones, not the, not the omnidirectional ones. And uh, I've given them 350 vacuum ISP, which I think is reasonable. We'll have to see. Uh, as far as the Raptor engines, I made the stats exactly what they said. They gave enough information for everything. Uh, the only information I didn't have was the mass of the engines, but that could be easily extrapolated. Uh, Elon Musk said that the engines, uh, the sea level engines were roughly the size of a Falcon 1, and so I used the Falcon 1 model actually. Uh, not the Falcon 1, the Merlin 1D model uh, to put the Raptor sea level atmosphere engine configuration on. This is for three of those engines. You can see the stats there. I've given them 12 ignitions for now. And for the vacuum engines, I used a scaled down M1 model. Uh, the vacuum engine is supposed to have a nozzle ratio of 200, which is remarkably big uh, to capture all of the ISP that they want. And so this is the most reasonable model for that. 
Uh, I do have the solar panels, and so I don't have the fan-like solar panels, but at least I've gotten uh, this far with them. So I've got a hinge to tilt them out, and then they'll extend as we saw in the video. It's just that they, they're not shaped like a fan. So I'll work on that, and probably somebody will come up with a 3D model to suit that. Other considerations, I guess we'll talk about the Raptor engines now. So uh, in my previous video, I had assumed a fairly high uh, chamber pressure for the Raptor engines because in order to get the 380 vacuum ISP, they had to be uh, on the order of 3,500 PSI. As it turns out, the actual uh, engines are going to be 4,300 PSI, which is way be you know it's, it was beyond what I expected. Some people asked uh, why my ISPs for Blue Origins were lower than the uh, the predicted ISPs for SpaceX, and that was because of the chamber pressure. Blue Origins engines, the BE4, has a chamber pressure of 1,950. These have 4,300. And I guess it's worth talking about the way this works. Chamber pressure means the little particles bouncing around the chamber, right? And so the pressure is how many particles they are, and then how fast they're bouncing around. And that's basically the same as what thrust is. Thrust is how much stuff you shoot out the back, and how fast you shoot it out the back. The ISP is really just how fast you shoot it out the back. And if the thrust is the combination of how much you shoot out the back and how fast you shoot out the back, the faster you shoot it out the back, the less stuff you have to shoot out to get the same thrust. I hope that makes sense. So the chamber pressure is sort of encapsulating the idea of uh, both how much stuff you've got and how fast they're bouncing around. And so the higher the pressure, the more efficiency you get and the more thrust you get from a particular engine. And so the BE4 has less than half the chamber pressure of these engines and so it gets less ISP. Um, okay thrust, right? Uh, but still less thrust than these as well. Okay, so that's the basic idea and uh, the rub is that if you have such a high chamber pressure is it safe to restart it? I mean, can you, can you reliably restart it? Because pressure is pressure and that means that it's doing wear and tear on everything. Uh, the higher the pressure, the more wear and tear you get. And so they're going to have to demonstrate that they can restart the engine. And then there's the bottom of the vehicle where they're clustering 42 of them. And there, if, if the N1 is any judge, you're going to have all sorts of resonance issues. Let's, let's go down and talk about that. So uh, just to finish up with this inner stage, I have a tank here for liquid methane and liquid oxygen that I haven't got filled yet. But once I start trying to land this sucker, the first stage, I'll be using these uh, methane oxygen thrusters to try and orient and we'll have an extra bit of fuel there uh, to make sure that they have fuel. I don't know if cross-feeding... well I, I suppose I could toggle cross-feeding here to be true but that messes up my staging so I won't do that. As you can see that uh, with the appropriate amount of fuel, assuming that you're burning the center engines here, which are the only ones that gimbal out of these, right? The other ones don't gimbal. Uh, you're gonna have a stage time of about four minutes and two seconds. Uh, they do throttle, so we don't have to worry about the thrust-to-weight ratio being high there. And that that's about it. So, scaled up grid fins. Uh, I don't know if they're scaled up enough. Um, once I do landing stuff, which I, I'm not going to do in this video, I'll probably be doing it in a live stream. Why can't I see the solar panels inside? I don't want to see those. Okay, but yeah, I'll have to see whether those work at all or not. And then landing legs. Uh, the landing legs, uh, uh, both the landing legs on the on the spaceship itself and on the land on the launcher do not look like the normal SpaceX landing legs. Uh, in on the spacecraft, they actually are pistons going down, uh, not the uh, folding out ones. And e Elon mentioned that there are three grid fins on this vehicle and three landing legs because they didn't need any more, so that's why I put three. Um, yeah, and so I, I don't think these looked quite the same either, so we'll have to review that. Anyway, uh, one of my interesting innovations, aside from having all the engine configurations correct uh, and having this maze of launch clamps, was getting the engine clusters right. And you can see they're very nicely evenly spaced. And there are 21 on the outside, 14 here, 6 and then 1. 
Uh, these seven are the only ones that gimbal, so you can see gimbal is free there. But if we look at the outside two rings, the gimbal is locked. But you'll note there's only two engines in the staging, and that is because I'm using SSTU. And so this all counts as one engine with the right thrust, of course. Uh, as you can see, 115,000 uh, kilonewtons vacuum, 107,000 uh, sea level. And so they've got the right thrust, it's just that they are clusters. And so I made custom clusters for this purpose. And yeah, that is one of the things that I worked on. So uh, this tank was supposed to have 6,700 tons of propellant, was what the presentation said. So I have 6,700 tons of propellant. The empty mass of this stage is indeed around 275 tons dry. Uh, maybe a little bit too light uh, looking at it. Uh, maybe a little bit too light. The overall height of the vehicle, by the way, is 122 tons. I've lifted it up uh, off, off the ground. Maybe you can get it. Uh, so 122 meters was what they said was the height of the vehicle. And that's not working right at all. Uh-oh. I think I have broken hanger extender. Let me go out and come back in. Okay, so now we are back in, and you can see that the height is 125.3 meters, and it's about 3 meters off the ground. By the way, it'll still blow up the launch pad. Uh, this is 1.1.2, and it blows up the launch pad all the time. So it will blow up the launch pad on launch. There's no avoiding that. Uh, so it could be a little bit heavier. Um, why don't I, uh, I... I've got an easy way of solving that. I'm going to open this up. And I'm going to add the methane here and then lock it. And that's actually making it just about right, I think. Once again, uh, using balloon tanks here. So, yeah, I'll have to nudge that one way or another. It's possible. Uh, the, the thing is, uh, they said in the presentation, 77.5 meters. I guess it could be a little bit taller in length. And then we could dump utilization down. Okay, that's much closer to the indicated dry mass. I suspect that uh, the burn time will actually be about three minutes. We've got a fair amount of thrust to weight ratio there to get it off the ground. And also, the stated mass of the entire vehicle was supposed to be 1,500 tons. But when you add it all up, uh, I don't get to that. So I, I think there's room for more fuel in the first stage. But for now, we certainly have enough to get started. So let's take out the launch pad and see how it does. Okay, so here's what it looks like. And I could do better. Uh, there will be improvements on this. But for now, it's pretty good. Uh, we can turn the lights and the windows on, so that's nice. See, they glow. So that's a plus, but I need to add the docking ports and a lot of other fiddly bits. Actually, the main consideration for me right now is to try and add some sort of aerodynamics to this because it's going to have to aerobrake at Mars and then it's going to have to aerobrake back at Earth as well. And so it needs, I mean, it might look like a bullet, but it really needs to be a lifting body of some kind in order to create that kind of drag. So, and more importantly, it needs to be able to maintain the lift, uh, not, not the lift, the pitch, because it can't just be using, well, it could probably use RCS thrusters, but it need much more powerful RCS thrusters, let me put it that way. So, yeah, there are many considerations about that. Uh, let's just get to a launch. It will blow up the launch pad. There's nothing I can do. I tried lifting it higher in order to avoid it, but it didn't work. So, ignition. And launch. Now one benefit of using SSTU is that we will get good frame rates during launch. As you can see, it's doing a fairly good job. One downside is the, the while the actual flames look right, the ultimate plume here does not. So yeah, that's the downside. Now, they were good enough to tell us exactly when the booster finishes its job. Uh, they said it goes to 5,375 miles per hour, which is 2,403 meters per second. So that's the horizontal velocity that imparts to the vessel. 
What I was unclear about, however, was whether that was surface relative to surface velocity or whether that was orbital velocity. If it's orbital velocity, we detach the booster sooner. If it is surface velocity, the booster has a lot more work to do. So, yeah, we're gonna have to see about that. Now, I've got this fully fueled, and it doesn't need to be. It's probably got 800 meters per second extra. So, it doesn't need to have all this fuel. Uh, Mr. Musk uh, mentioned that the plan was to basically put it into orbit empty. And, of course, it uses a lot, uh, it starts out with fuel on the ground, but it uses it to get into orbit and it ends up empty in orbit with a little bit of fuel, presumably, to maneuver and do basic stuff like that. The fact that it only has raptors and no like orbital maneuvering system or, in, or anything, uh, except for RCS, is interesting. I'm wondering if there's some larger RCS system, except for the central Raptor sea level engines, you know, something else that could be used to maneuver the rocket and make uh, more significant adjustments than the RCS. But then again, normally space stuff is done very patiently and so maybe they just do it with RCS and just wait forever like as if they were ion engines or something so it could work either way though you know I'm still pining for methane burning super dracos frankly okay we are we, we might be tossing this a little bit high but Let's see. Yeah, probably, because we're not reserving much delta V here. I'm gonna go with the surface one. And so there. And then, okay, I'm gonna set. Gonna switch to here. No, no, no. Yes. 3,635 meters per second left there on 11 seconds of throttle with all the engines though but let's get this one started now one of the reasons I like these engines in particular is the sound as you can tell I'm running all nine engines including the sea level engines because they're the ones that have gimbling we're gonna roll so that the windows are on the top side now I'll turn on RCS yeah, so they've got some interesting aerodynamic stuff going on at the bottom of this. I'm not entirely sure how to mimic that in KSP. Not yet, anyway. So I'll have to experiment with that before trying to bring this back into the atmosphere of anything. At this point, with the RCS thrusters active and all, maybe I can shut down the three center engines and just let the vacuum engines do it. So the three center engines are off now, and only the vacuum engines are active. And you can see the RCS thrusters working to keep orientation, but they're not doing a good enough job of it, it looks like. You can see we're drifting. These engines do not gimbal. So I'll have to put much more powerful RCS thrusters on this. Alright, alright, let's get the center engines back on then. The center engines are another SSTU cluster, so they're reading as one engine here, even though there are three of them. Now what I would like to do is actually have this be a hollow section, so that we can put stuff inside, uh, and see how much we can put. I mean, in the presentation, it may it imply that there was a lot of space in there. I'm not, uh, I'm not so sure, not for 100 people. So it might be a little bit cramped. We'll see. We need we need a hollow section in there to see how much space there really is. Personally, if I was going on the journey, I'd probably be learning as much as I could to make sure I could survive on Mars while on the trip. Oh, by the way, um, the trip time, 115 days specified, that's on the fastest possible trip that this could bring it. And to do that kind of trip, uh, that's a lot faster than any other journey to Mars we normally do. That's not a home and transfer journey. That's a quick transfer. And that means you have to use extra effort to slow down there too, which will be dependent on the heat shielding on this. 
normal journeys to Mars take a little bit longer than uh, four months. Normally, like six months. Okay, well, we're definitely in orbit. I put it into a high apoapsis. Maybe we can turn back to the booster? I don't know. It's really far away from Cape Canaveral now, though. If I wanted to bring it back, I should have started its retro burn much sooner. But we, we can test it out. Uh, that's not it. That's not it. That's it. Okay. So, RCS on retrograde. Let's see. Oh, I need to unlock these, this field here. There we go. Let's see if it can push it. It's already descending. I don't think it's going to be able to do anything in time. Let's do another launch where I focus on the first stage. Okay, while we're back in the VAB, I wanted to mention a few things. First of all, the first stage resonance issue. So, what happened with the N1, which had 30 engines on its uh, bottom cluster, is that basically fuel lines and all act like, uh, like instruments, musical instruments, and so they have certain frequencies that they vibrate at. And if you get them all vibrating uh, in just the right way, you can basically rip the vehicle apart or at least cause enough vibrations to damage parts of the vehicle. The only way to test against that is if you just try and light it all at the same time, uh, which it didn't do with the N1. They never tested it with all 30 engines lit, which was the problem. Um, now, if they're going to do this, they're going to have to test it with all 42 engines lit, and, then, and only then will they be able to see whether it's really possible to have so many engines working at the same time and not have any issues. So yeah, it's it's not a trivial thing uh, unless they have more maps than I think they do, which you never know. Uh, there might be a mathematical model for how all this stuff would work together, in which case I hope it's right. Um, the other thing that uh, uh, I, I want to comment on was the possibility of sending the ITS to Jupiter and, and beyond or anything like that. I was actually sort of disappointed that no mention was made of visiting asteroids, uh, but the asteroid belt would be a very likely location and uh, relatively easy to get to compared to Jupiter. The problem with sending crew to Jupiter at least, uh, it's... Uh, it could certainly send probes and cargo and such, but crew, passengers, is radiation. And when asked about radiation in the Q&A, Elon Musk uh, said it wasn't that big a deal. But well, it's not that big a deal if you've got a 115-day trip to Mars. If you've got a multi-year trip to Jupiter, and, and also at the same time you've got the huge radiation levels at Jupiter, ITS really can't manage that. Uh, Venus is also a little bit tough because it's closer to the Sun and the radiation is higher there as well, though the trip is shorter. So, but Jupiter radiation levels are not to be trivialized. So I don't know about the images of uh, ITS on Europa or anything like that. Um, a lot more would need to be done. And just because it might have enough delta V to get to Jupiter does not mean it has enough delta V to make orbit around one of those planets. Uh, it does have enough delta V to get to Jupiter. It just can't stop. Uh, and then there's the radiation too. And that, so so that's the rub. Now you could strip out some of the cargo, and you'll know, have less cargo. Remember, we're carrying uh, 300. Uh, that's that's worth talking about. We are carrying 300 tons of cargo here. So let's remove the 300 tons of car cargo and see what happens. So now we've got that tank empty, and you can see it's got 10,000 meters per second. Uh, that that's probably yeah. Let, let's say you actually filled it with fuel. Actually, let's uh, remove all tanks and add that. Well, that gives you a little bit more. Uh, you get to uh, ten thousand nine hundred sixty-one meters per second. But again, that would be very difficult because uh, once you get to Jupiter, you do have to slow down. And if you're uh, if you want to get Jupiter's help to do that, you're going to need to get close to Jupiter, which means really really high radiation levels. And if you're not gonna get Jupiter's help to do that, then you have to do it on your own. Which is we're talking for Europa, talking about 5,500 meters per second, something like that. So it's not easy. It's easier for probes that don't have to worry so much about irradiating their passengers than it would be for something like this. But anyway, we will have our av gas as our 
payload, if you will. And this time I'm going to try and bring this guy back, but this is the first time I'm trying this, so probability of success is low. Ah, it looks like it pre-exploded the launch pad for us. That's that's kind of it. We hadn't even ignited the engines. Okay, throttle up, SAS on, ignition. And launch. I would like better sounds on this stage and the better plume. We'll see about that. Yeah, if I was gonna design a Europa thing, I'd probably have this section be sort of like a separate vehicle and then have another stage and basically the Europa vehicle be the top of this so this part would come back or something or maybe maybe you would actually have this be something that could open up and the Europa vehicle would uh, proceed on to Europa uh, or you know uh, this would boost it to like the edge of Earth space for instance you'd get to the edge of Earth space I really need to turn don't I um, you could get to the edge of Earth space, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, close to the moon or something, and then let the Europa vehicle do the rest of the stuff, uh, let it depart from the cargo bay, if you will, and then close this all back up, and then have this come back down to Earth or Earth orbit. And then you could uh, shove another Europa vehicle inside, if you will, and refuel this, have it boost the thing back out and do that sort of idea all over again. Something like that could work out, but not this whole thing, I don't think. So there's a suboptimal trajectory, but I think that's probably good for testing purposes. You can see we're not actually very far from Cape Canaveral right now. Now, I don't know if it's gonna throttle down during launch here. Whether they're gonna keep it to 3G's or something nice for the passengers. Considering you're gonna experience 4 to 6G's at the Mars side, maybe not. Maybe they're not gonna be kind, but who knows. Okay, that's about the right number. Set. Switch. Okay, that's... I always switch to the wrong thing. There we go. Alright, RCS thrusters on. Unlocked a little bit there. Okay, retrograde. We are in space. And our, yeah, the RCS is firing. Just very, very slowly. This is the problem. I don't know how powerful the thrusters are going to be. Okay, I'm going to temporarily switch off the center engines, which will be necessary for landing, and just keep the outer engines on that they don't gimbal so this is a dodgy sort of situation and I'll add the center engines if it turns out to be necessary but we need to kill all of our horizontal speed right now and also go back go back a bit so we gotta add horizontal speed in the opposite direction so that's a lot let's get some reference right now we'll be 772 kilometers away on this side by the time we smack into the surface I think maybe I should just light the center engines and use their gimbling to turn around because this feels like it's gonna take forever also it's interesting it's taking the methane from here but not the oxygen I'm not entirely sure what it's doing no, it is taking the oxygen, but it seems like we have an overabundance of oxygen. That's weird. They should use the same mix of fuels as the rest. So I might have a mistake there somehow. I'll have to take a look at that. This is my first use of Mephalox RCS thrusters ever, so not a surprise. Yeah, I don't think it's going to get there in time. Let me get the center engines back on. And we're going to use the full might of this stage to retro burn. Uh, 
Uh, okay, I didn't have enough fuel there. We were still 286. We weren't exactly pointed in the best direction, and we used some of that fuel to just turn around, which is not good. So I'll have to perfect this a little bit more. There's a lot of work to do here. And it looks like maybe I should assume that they're talking about 2,403 meters per second orbital velocity, in which case it's more like 2,100. Uh, in, in either case, it's about where the Saturn V would have been expended. Uh, that Saturn, Saturn V first stage. It's about the same. Alright, well, on that note, and probably I'll be experimenting more with this and landing on, uh, on a live stream at some point. Oh, we are still carrying some of that. But, yeah, I'll, I'll experiment more later. Alright, so, well, with uh, this, this immediate discussion of the possibilities with this particular rocket. I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.